uh, Keith and John, I don't see him here, um, for inviting me to talk. I feel a little bit like a fish out of water because I'm really not in this field. Hydrocephalus is a little different beast. Um, so what I'm hoping to do here is actually to tell you a little bit about what, we, what we're doing, um, introduce you to this technique, and maybe um, start a little discussion about its application, potential application, in, in the spine, in, in, in Chiari, um, in, in similar uh, disorders. Um, so just a little overview. So I'll talk a, bit, a little bit where, where I come from is actually, you know, we, we spent a lot, of, uh, many years looking at CSF pulsatility. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about the history. What, what is it, at least when we think of the brain hydrocephalus, what, what's known, what's not known, hypotheses and potential uh, understanding mechanisms for changes in pulsatility uh, in, in disease. And then I will look at this, uh, this other technique, elastography, which allows us to get at, I think, some element of, of something that may be driving or at least is related to pulsatility. Um, we'll talk about methodology or particular study. We're interested in, in chronic shunting and splint vent ventricle syndromes. I'll show you some results and then some conclusions. So um, we've talked about, and I think there'll be a number of talks, um, uh, looking using phase contrast imaging um, to measure uh, very accurately, um, although there was some question about that a few minutes ago. Um, uh, flow <laughs> um, uh, at different di different uh, parts of the brain, and we can um, we can measure not only uh, CSF flow, um, but uh, arterial venous flow, as, as you've seen in a number of talks. Um, so back um, going back all the way to um, 1996, I believe it was. Uh, Bradley published the first. Uh, first article looking at um, aqueductal pulsatility in, in uh, communicating hydrocephalus, showing um, this threshold for what would be considered abnormal versus normal and therefore would be a good candidate for surgery. Um, the, the limit there was about 42, I think it's 42 microliters. I believe I'm at around that limit or so. Um, uh, there's a lot of question. As to the uh, as to that um, that threshold, um, a number of papers have shown relationship between pulsatility in the aqueduct and shunt outcome. Where there have been a number of large studies um, um, in recent years that shown really no no relationship between um, pulsatility and shunt shunt outcome. There is one thing that I think most of the uh, what most of the literature does seem to agree on that extreme hyperdynamic pulse, pulsations, uh, you know, 100, uh, I, I would say actually probably over 200 or so uh, microliters um, seems to all, in almost, in almost all studies, to agree um, that that's a good indication for, for positive outcome. Some lingering questions, and actually, um, I may dial this back a, a little bit because I want to thank Marcus. I, you know, I've seen your work, but actually, I guess I haven't followed it closely enough because I think that you're starting to convert me a little bit. Um, one of the questions, you know, some of the questions that we have is 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 pulsatility does it really play a fundamental um, role in the in in function in CSF function, or is it simply an extraneous artifact? Heart beats, so CSF beats. Um, do they play a role in ventricular dilation? Um, and I'll look at that in a second. Um, what, what happens in hydrocephalus and what happens with shunting? You know, I saw this comment, um, this is back from 2012, and the real question that I have is um, here, um, evidence that increased aqueductal CSF stroke volume is a marker of impaired CSF flow dynamics. And the question that I have is, what is impaired? Um, I think I've seen good evidence, in, in, at least in, in, 
in sphingomyelia and uh, Lynn's talk was actually really, um, I'd seen the papers, but now I think I'm seeing more clearly that I think there is an impairment, but I, I haven't seen any evidence in the brain that it's really impaired as opposed to changed. And I think there's a difference between impairment and change. Change means me simply, yes, it's different, but does it really have anything to do with, with the pathophysiology? You know, there are a number of potential models that we can look at. I really wanted to go into more detail, but, our, but unfortunately I don't have time. Um, there's a number of things that can change a, pul a pulsatility in the brain. Um, simply elevating ICP, if you look at this uh, classical PV curve from Tony Marmaru, Right? If I increase the pressure, the slope of this, of this graph is simply the, uh, essentially is a measure of the pulsatility, the com measure of the compliance. And because of that, the same pulse of volume of blood coming into the brain at low pressure creates a, a low pulse, and at high pressure creates a, a high pulse. The same thing's going to happen if you decrease the intracranial compliance. You change the compliance of the tissue itself, that's going to shift this curve. It's going to make the curve steeper, and therefore at the same pressure, it's going to, because it's steeper, it's going to give you higher pulsations. But again, it's not necessarily fundamental um, uh, pathology. Um, third option that people have, have talked about is this drum surface theory, right? As the ventricles get bigger, you simply have a larger surface over which to beat. And because those, because you have a larger surface beating, so you have more you can put you can push more more fluid out of that system with the same pulsations that are coming into the brain, uh, beating against that drum. And the, the the fourth one is is as someone mentioned, Grant Bateman. Um, uh, I believe this this phrase uh, goes back to him: pulse wave encephal encephalopathy. That the increased pulse pulsations are actually transmitted. Uh, into the microvasculature. You know, um, so there are, just relating to two of these, um, you know, we, we've shown that physiologically, simply by changing the respiratory rate and therefore changing the hypercapnia, um, uh, you can change stroke volume. Again, it's not really fundamental change uh, uh, pathologically. Um, we did some work in using two photon microscopy where we're able to measure capillary pulsatility in uh, a rat model of hydrocephalus, and we're actually able to show that there is, in fact, a relationship between macro pulsations, stroke volume in the aqueduct, and micro pulsations, pulsatility at the, at the, the micro level in the, in the capillaries. So the upshot is that there are multiple overlapping factors that potentially contribute to pulsation, that can create pulsation in the brain, but um, again, are they linked to impaired CSF dynamics? And again, I think I want to make, um, for the moment, um, maybe a disconnect between the brain and the spine because I'm, I'm really intrigued by some of the data that I saw this morning. Uh, I've got to go home and think about it some more. Um, but what about intracranial compliance? I, measured that, uh, I mentioned that term a number of times, um, and I think it's important. And if you look in the literature, literature is replete with statements that talk about changes in compliance, and, and in particular, for the most part, decreases in intracranial compliance in hydrocephalus. That's, if you talk to at least some, most of the neurosurgeons that I've talked to, um, have that sense that the brain becomes uh, tighter uh, in, in, in hydrocephalus. Um, and in fact, I've heard that I heard this comment a uh, while ago, a couple of years ago, at, at a conference. Slit ventricle sy syndrome is a rare condition in which brain compliance is usually low. Um, all of this is, is is hypothetical. There's no evidence, except for there's some of this. Uh, the measurements by Chosnik, uh, Marek Chosnik's lab, I think, is one of the exceptions to that, where you have actual data on changes in compliance. So how do we measure compliance? Um, there are obviously invasive techniques with the, the you know, infusion tests. Uh, someone mentioned Alperin, um, uh, his uh, MRICP test, which we, uh, I really think of it as MRICC test. The, the, the jump from compliance to pressure is a leap of faith. Um, but at least for measuring compliance, um, I think it's an interesting technique. Um, 
And I want, what I want to talk about now is elastography. Um, it's important to, to see the difference between these techniques. These are essentially giving you a single number, a single number for the entire intracranial uh, compartment, the compliance of the system. Um, Elastography is an Im imaging technique, and therefore we can look at, on the voxel level, we, look, we can look at uh, compliance or elastance, the, the one over compliance uh, at every pixel in the brain. So what I think of elastography is essentially a virtual pal palpation technique. Um, we'd like to measure the stiffness. Stiffness is a fundamental property um, that uh, physicians use all the time. Um, so elastography is a way of doing that non-invasively. Obviously, we can't do that in the brain. We can't palpate the brain. Um, elastography being used extensively is actually now FDA, uh, I believe it's FDA approved on all of the scanners um, for, uh, for, um, bot for liver. Um, and it's used to stave li stage li liver cirrhosis. Um, kind of makes sense that you can do it in the liver, you can feel it, you can push, um, but in the brain, maybe it's a little harder. Um, just before I go on, um, so again, this difference, sorry, I guess I didn't need this slide, I mentioned this a second ago. So these techniques are measured global compliance, we're going to measure, measure um, we're going to measure local compliance. Um, another important uh, distinction when you, when you think about this technique, is they're actually measuring very different uh, components of the compliance. Um, when you measure, when you do an infusion test, you're essentially c compressing the system. You're putting volume into the system and you're asking, what does the pressure do? How does the pressure change? Um, you're looking at volume changes. You're looking at compress compressibility of the system. The brain, for the most part, if you look at on the pixel level, is not compressible. It's mostly water. The easiest thing we can do, we can, we can shear. It's much easy, easier to shear a system than to compress it uh, when, it's, uh, when it's basically a water-based uh, water system. So what we'll be looking at, in, in, what, what you, for the most part, look at in, in elastography is, is, is shear compression. Um, so how do we do this? Well, the best way to feel an object without actually touching it is to shake it and see how it, how it responds to that shaking. So we have to shake the brain. Um, this is a system that we use. So it's uh, MR-compatible um, air-activated pistons that sit um, against the zygoma, um, driven at uh, around 30 hertz. Um, it fits inside a standard head coil, and um, we've had kind of a range of, of reactions to it from patients. Um, and and uh, some say it's cool. One patient actually said, why did you stop? It stopped my headaches. Um, and some, some people don't like it all that much. Um, important thing to realize is that um, we're not actually measuring stiffness. Okay, the MR scanners are measuring stiffness. All it's doing is measuring motion. So we can generate these fancy maps of motion in all three directions. Um, but then we have to take that information and actually put it through essentially a bunch of equations of motion. We have to solve the equations of motion. We, so we, it's, an, it's an inversion, and it's um, very dependent on the model that you make of the brain. So be, depending on that model, I can get a different answer. So something to keep in mind. Uh, when you are thinking about this, when you're looking at reading, reading on this technique. So our study, um, we're looking in shunt-dependent uh, hydrocephalus patients, 30 patients to this point, um, around age 20. Uh, we've got 20 controls uh, to compare to. They were not age matched, but the roughly the same um, age, um, at least in the mean. 3T scanner, we did, we scanned at three, actually three frequencies. Um, the advantage there is that the pattern, right, it's, you're essentially setting up a standing wave in the brain, and the pattern changes as you change frequency. Um, we did, we looked at flow as well, T1, we're also collecting DTI hopefully for future analysis. Um, clinically, we're collecting uh, information on headache 
headache index, quality of life, shunt revision history, and we've just recently added cognitive testing to look at associations um, there. So what we're interested in is, is uh, in slit ventr ventricle sy syndrome, the, the issue is chronic drainage. And the, the, some of the questions that are remaining are, what do the ventricles do? Why do the ventricles sometimes not dilate when there's a shunt failure? The shunt blocks, right? If the, if the system is working properly, the ventricles should blow up. Why don't they? Or you can have shunt failure-like symptoms with a, ver with, with a, ver with a working shunt. Um, there is this, uh, again, controversial, Hal's not looking, so he's not going to throw anything at me, um, term of uh, craniocerebral disproportion, um, where the skull doesn't adequately um, uh, accommodate the growing brain. Um, there are plateau waves that, that, that exist. Maybe those are associated with headache. Um, but again, are there, are there changes in brain compliance in the fundamental properties of the brain tissue that don't allow the system to uh, essentially respond in the way that it's designed. Mark, before you take that yeah. slide away. <laughs> take I back. should have shut up. Okay, huh? yeah. I should shut up? I should have shut up. <laughs> yeah. That's what this is. Take it back to the previous slide. Uh, you, you can't do See that? Way. Yeah, <laughs> no, on, that, on the side over there. Yeah, okay. You see, you, you, you commented on this. Do you yeah. think he has a yeah. cistern or not? Do I, do I see, think he has a, a cistern? The, 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 uh, para, um, the pineal region cistern or the back, the cistern in the back. Is, do you not think he has, he has cortical subarachnoid space that can be seen in a, in a, in a cistern in the back? What Here? I'm saying is that the question is whether this is cephalocranial disproportion. Right which is crazy, right. yeah. or whether okay. this is venous hypertension, which is what it is, okay. are two different things, and you can tell by that, by that okay. MRI, okay. CT. Um, that's a side point, but, but an interesting side point, and we'll talk about it later. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. That's fine. No, no, but venous hypertension as well, right, is something that I think will change the system and change, uh, affects, not only affects the, the compliance of the system, right, but also um, can be um, affected by the compliance of the system. Um, how, how, you, how, you, how you react to the venous, venous hypertension, but we'll talk about it later. Um, so headache is a big problem uh, in these patients. Uh, almost half of them have uh, suffer from serious headaches, uh, and the way they're treated, um, there's a variety of way, uh, uh, ways of treating them. Um, the way to treat slip ventricle syndromes, ventricles which collapse, um, I think there is, uh, this is not too long ago, 2010, there's really no consensus, I think, out there in terms of how to treat. And unfortunately, at least what I've heard is that sometimes this is the approach. Um, you know, fix it, uh, put in a new, put in a new shunt, and let's see what happens. What happens in, in chronic, uh, uh, chronic shunting, um, uh, at least in, I don't know what your, your experience is, Rick or, or Mark, um, but I, 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 so sorry, I meant in Tal. But Rick uh, Abbott um, says he sees them in, in a large percentage of, of, of shunts. Uh, you can get intermittent shunt blockage, variable and pressure, and pressure because of that. Um, slit ventricle syndrome, the full blown syndrome, um, severe chronic headaches, multiple revisions. If you think, you know, the way I think about multiple revisions is essentially uh, the equivalent of repeated, repeated brain trauma, right? The, the ventricles blow up, there's some sort of trauma to the brain, you fix it, it goes back and forth. Um, so I'm going to show you some results. Um, to try to understand, just to understand these results, when you think about what happens um, uh, to a, 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 when you throw a pebble into a pond, the water is actually not uh, moving outwards, the waves are moving outwards. If you look at any point here, if you, if you put a fishing bob uh, here, it's going to move out a little bit. For the most part, it's going to move up and down. So when looking, looking at these waves, we're actually looking at waves which are actually moving not in the direction that the waves look like they're moving. Um, it's actually uh, perpendicular to, to that direction. So here's some of, the, some of the results, the waves that we can generate. So I'm looking at actually the tissue is actually moving A to P. And the waves are actually moving um, uh, uh, right to left in this case, and we can look at again waves moving right to left. Now the the the, the um, waves are moving um, inward, 
So these are some of the, um, uh, I want to try to get to my, my, uh, my results here. So what we found, surprisingly enough, is that in hydrocephalus, the brain tissue is actually, is actually softer. The brain is softer. Um, maybe, potentially, we can explain that as a loss of structural in integrity of the, of the tissue. Um, looking at some of the other parameters, I did say we measured flow. There was a, a drop, just barely statistically significant in the patients, which people have seen in NPH. Um, drop in CSF flow, this is again at C2. Um, trying to look at some correlations, again this is not a, not a great correlation, but there was a correlation between stiffness, stiffness increasing with increasing, you know, toward the normal, with increasing arterial stroke volume. So maybe there is some relationship there. Um, um, I did, it's really nice to see some clinical correlations. This was in the abstract, unfortunately, with more patients in the study, um, that went away. Um, but that is what it is. Um, I'm going to skip this. So just to go to my conclusions, so Emory is a potential new measure, quantitative measure of whole brain outcomes of looking uh, directly at brain biomechanics. There's a lower um, uh, stiffness in, in hydrocephalus. Maybe this is something like uh, accelerated aging. This is a paper where they looked at and they, they found a decline in stiffness um, with aging. Um, what I just want to put up here really quickly, um, moving and maybe for the discussion um, over T, um, is applications to chi uh, Chiari and spine. You know, some of the issues that we have to look at, one is resolution. Um, we're looking for the most part, we look at, at whole brain, um, stiffness, uh, resolution is an issue because uh, elastography is really not a local technique. Uh, anisotropy is, mu I think, much higher in, in the spine and I think will affect the measurement. Standardization, I think, in this field is a huge issue, as I alluded to before. The way you get your results out is highly dependent on how you process it. So some of the things to think about, and um, I want to thank um, all my collaborators and thank you for your time. Yeah. So, Mark, did you measure um, edema? Because one of the things that does reduce brain or any tissue stiffness is, um, is edema or increased water content. So, measure things. edema how? Yeah, so, just by any? visual. Sorry? You said you did diffusion measurements. Did you measure changes in MD or anything? Uh, or did you see it on your um, yeah, that's anatomical it. images? Um, I mean, typically in hydrocephalus, you get periventricular edema. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, we haven't looked at that carefully. Um, I, I'm pretty sure there are, there, we, did, we did do DTI, I think, pretty sure there are changes in MD uh, in the patients. I haven't looked for correlations, again, between those data. So it might be interesting to look at that. Yeah, Brian. Um, can you give us an idea of where the along the road is elastography to be used in general clinics? So again, like I said, it's, I, I think it's being, being used generally clinically in, in liver um, to move forward into brain, into spine. Um, I don't know, that's a good question. Is the liver, um, but, sorry? The liver uh, system, the shaker, is something, is it Siemens or what? It's a, well, no, you can, you can purchase it for any, any, for any sit scanner. We actually, yeah, we're just about to buy one for our Philips was developed on a GE at the Mayo. That's great. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, more? I yeah. was wondering about the patients who had their brains uh, shook. Uh-huh, okay. Did you have some who found it horrible? Um, there's one who couldn't take it. So, so one thing you have to realize is the, uh, what I, I, which I didn't point out, the, the, the vibrations that we're looking at in the brain, so the waves that we're looking at, are on the order of about 50 microns. Um, the actual shaking in the brain is probably on the order of less than a millimeter. Um, you do feel it. There are some patients, or some even controls, who I wouldn't say unbearable, but they don't like it. Um, not unbearable. Depends on, you know, varies from, from person to person. We have 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.